Hey everybody, how's it going tonight? Um, I got uh, some friends here. It's been a while since we've had a guest on, and this is the first time that we've had more than one at a time, I think. I want to introduce you guys to some folks that I hang out with on Twitter. We have a, a little community called War Porn, and don't worry, it's all war, it's no porn. Um, and, and we noticed as this community was growing that we were building a collection of Cold War turns hot alternate history uh, buffs and authors. And so I wanted to get us all together and, and just have a conversation about parts of the uh, alternate history genre. Specifically today, we're going to talk about uh, various points of departure. Uh, but first, let me go ahead and, and introduce you guys uh, to the fellas and just going in no particular order. Uh, first, I want to mention Colin Salt. He's the That's CS me. down there. And he does that. I really love his blog, the Fold Apocalypse blog. I'll put links in the description to all these things. But, but when I found, I think I ran into a book called the war that never was. And I had not heard of this book before and I didn't realize that it was a thing. And so I started Googling around and one of the first sites I found was Colin's blog and it's just fantastic. It's really, really cool stuff. Yes, it's amazing. I, it's one of the best <laughs> things I've ever done in my life and I'm not exaggerating. It's, it's amazing for me. <laughs> and Colin has also uh, done some work with the uh, Sea Lion Press. So you can see some of his stuff over there. But I think most excitingly of all, he did publish his, his first, no, well, actually, no, his, this was your second, All Union? Uh, second, yeah, actually, it's my third, but it's, yeah, my, it's my first old, real alternate history in this genre, basically. Right. So that's what I'll call that. So, yeah. So, and, so yeah, Colin Salt, All Union. Go ahead. Yeah, that's, never mind. Keep going. Oh. Uh Next up, uh, so we'll go ahead and stick with the blog topic, but uh, next we have Mike C. He has another great Cold War Goes Hot blog called the uh, World War III 1987. And, and that one is, you know, also it's been around for a while. It's got a lot of detail and, you know, he just builds on it over time. So that's been uh, just a lot of fun keeping up with that. It's, it's interesting, and you're going to hear a lot about this, uh, you know, as we move through the various stories, because they're, we're telling World War III. It's, you know, almost always Soviet Union, United States, or rather Warsaw Pact NATO. Uh, so there's a lot of commonalities. So I think it's really one of my favorite things is when one of us comes across something the other has recently written and we realize, oh, we're, you know, we are writing the same story, um, you know, and, and it's neat to see the different conclusions that we come to. Um, and uh, let's see, anything else uh, that I'm missing there, Mike? I guess that's enough for now. Um, just... Real quick, I've got a first, finally, first off, uh, first novel is going to be published. Right now, it's looking like September. It's going to be out. Um, looking it's... forward to that. Yeah, Thanks. That, that, that elusive yeah. novel. <laughs> yeah, it's been, oh. Keeps trying to get away from you. <laughs> the publishing house, you know, they it's, it's a business for them. So sometimes they're not moving as fast as I'd like them to. No big deal. Right. But the um, first book is going to be called Dawn of the Dragon. It's set on a U.S. Uh, China conflict in the near future, so technically it's World War III, but it's a more contemporary World War III. That's right. So. And and for my viewers and readers, uh, you know, it's going to be probably you know similar, but um, a little more compact, I'm sure, than the Monroe Doctrine series that I worked <laughs> with with uh, James James Razone. Um, I'm really looking forward to see what Mike uh, Mike has to do with that. That's going to be that's going to be Thanks. really cool. Thanks, sir. Uh, of course. Next up, we have Joel and Bart and you two. Uh, much like the war that never was, I came across you guys uh, on the, the bulletin board for the video game Command Modern Naval Air Operations, which is now just Command Modern Operations. Um, and you guys wrote a book called Northern Fury. And, and we're all we're I think that we're all more impatiently waiting a second one to that than we are Mike's Dawn of the Dragon. 
because you know Mike has this excuse and you guys are just lazy. So tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. Life, life is getting in the way uh, of, of book number two, but uh, it is in the works, uh, and it picks up literally uh, the next step downrange uh, from where the last book leaves off. That's great. Yeah, to hear. Just to clarify, the the delay is my fault, not not Bart's. <laughs> Well, you can't write a novel and get a PhD at the same time. What the hell? True. He's right. Uh, that leads us to uh, to TK Blackwood. And this one always amuses me because when I first came across Blue Masquerade, there were two things it had going against it. One, junior varsity cover. Mm, yeah, that was a that was a second string cover you had there. And then the other one was uh, that I didn't understand how he could have written a book about World War III between, you know, Russia and NATO in 1992. I mean, that's that's a two-week war. Um, you know, they come over, we blow them up from the air, and then, you know, we set up McDonald's in, in Eastern Europe. Um, <laughs> and so I actually, I actually was like, I wouldn't say I was refusing to read them, but I just, I lacked a lot of interest in picking that up. Cause I'm like, this guy clearly doesn't know anything about the cold war, about, you know, the Russians and the Soviets. And within, when I finally did bite the bullet, um, and I was about to say something mean, but I'm not going to, it wasn't to anybody here. It was to somebody <laughs> who's not here. Um, I, I finally read. I finally read the book, and within the first, you know, twenty minutes, it, it was it was explained to me, and and that's what we want to talk about today. I said points of departure. Uh, ah. So again, it's where the story changes, or I'm sorry, where the timeline changes between their universe and our universe, however you want to look at it. So I, I want to kick it to TK first, so he can explain to us. How on earth you can have a interesting World War III starting in 1992? So, what was your point of departure? So, I, I don't even remember when I first became aware of the assassination attempt on Leonid Brezhnev. Uh, but at some point, when I when I discovered this, I was kind of blown away by, you know, what an incredible change in history it would have been had this freak event actually gone through. If he had been killed, um, I mean, clearly there's a lot to be said on the topic, but Brezhnev played a significant role in the downfall of the Soviet Union, the decline um, that ultimately, you know, took it off the, the, the world stage. So, you know, again, what would have happened if somebody more competent had taken command, somebody more interested in modernizing, keeping pace with things? Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the story goes in 1969, um, an army deserter decided for some reason he was just going to take Brezhnev out, took a pistol, took a shot of the motorcade and just through sheer luck did not get Brezhnev. But I mean, butterfly flaps its wings it could have easily gone the other way that's exactly right in fact i'm glad you brought that up because the butterfly effect is what people that aren't into alternate history this is one of the easiest ways for you to understand that you know uh, what you think is an insignificant action can cause downstream effects and actions and reactions that reverberate through uh you know through the through the whole world and and that's how you can end up with with changes um, did you did you consider TK any other uh, alternate uh, or I'm sorry points of departure? I th this current iteration of my series is far different than the first one I was going to do, which was I don't even know how to describe it like a totally gonzo World War Three with like space shuttles dropping nuclear bombs and just just completely <laughs> off the wall. And at some point, oh, no, I decided now I want you to remake that so I can read it. That's <laughs> right. That's Every time I, I tell I that love. story, yeah. Every time I say that, people will say, "Oh wow, I want to read that one." Um, maybe, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, I mean, it, it just, at some point I decided to be more down to earth and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to write a story where it could go either way, you know, at certain points in, in history, you know, tide is just against generally against the Soviet Union. They just, there's no conceivable way they could pull out a win, but looking at a lot of the weapons they had in development in like the late eighties, you know, I figure if they had stronger economy, stronger, you know, national spirit, I guess, maybe in 1992, things could have been really up for grabs. So that kind of, I kind of gravitated on that point, I think. Yeah. And I think that you did a, a really good job. And like I said, um, you know, I tell anybody who'll listen, read that damn book. It's, <laughs> <laughs> um, mostly because actually here's what I like most about it. I think it is, uh, I was wrong and you proved me wrong. And so that makes me happy. That makes me laugh. Um, so, uh, I would, I would say really, really quickly, um, I 
and, and actually let me let me throw this out to the whole to the whole group. Did anybody actually start their work without a point of departure? I sort of did in that I don't have, didn't have, and still don't have this exact, um, and it's not an exact, oh, and Brezhnev got killed when he didn't in real life, that sort of thing, but I can kind of, if you want, I could might as well take this time to explain like the point of departure of all union and what I've come to and how that came about, because it's sort of like the opposite, so I can show both that and the opposite of what like a strong point of departure is. So, okay, so I'll be honest and say that All Union began with, um, it was kind of reverse engineered because you need to sort of come to an outcome, sort of like story first, where I wanted a surviving stronger and significantly stronger than TK's um, has it USSR so that it can actually be as well equipped as the stand-ins for it and the op form manuals are. Um, <laughs> and so anyway, so basically, and I took a few things from history, but so basically I hand waved it so that the USSR manages to have Unrealistically good, yes, I'll say that, economic reforms, unrealistically good political reforms, and that that's, I guess the biggest change is that Gorbachev never appears. I have a completely fictional national savior type called Anton Yachenko, who is a fictional character, and that's the only, and then that's what happens, I did use the term sovereign union for this reformed one because that was a name given to a supposedly changed treaty to the USSR that the August coup backfired. And speaking of that, I know Bart and Joel have things to say about that. So yeah, it's basically a, a sort of vague, I can sort of do what I want. And I even like to throw in some Easter eggs, like how different it is from this world by having, say, a Browns Lions Super Bowl. <laughs> you, know, football, you know how crazy that is. I, I do like, actually, I will, I will say as an aside, I do like when you, uh, when you throw some sports in there. It, uh, it always yes. makes me laugh. In fact, actually, one of my uh, last reviews on Amazon was was thanking me for allowing the Chargers to win the eighty one Super Bowl. So, I was <laughs> be happy with that. Yes. Um, but speaking of uh, of Joel and Bart, uh, what did you guys decide um, to to use as your point of departure? And more importantly, how close to the start of the book was your point of departure? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll take that one and hand off to to Joel. Um, uh, of course, it was it was the August coup um, that uh, that starts our book. Um, Hardliners take over. Uh, Gorby has a bad day uh, and a really bad headache. Um, so that's that's what launches the divergence for us. And I guess I probably started framing out the story around 91, 92. So it wasn't that far removed. Uh, I started developing harpoon scenarios for the predecessor uh, uh, of command. Uh, but uh, found Harpoon wanting and life got in the way and I just dropped that. Uh, but uh, so that that was it. Um, and so uh, I was in the Army, the Canadian Army, uh, during the Cold War days um, as a forward observer, you know, we had it drilled into us uh, uh, what was going to happen. Uh, so I was living that and I wanted to to, to map that out. Uh, and we've got a 94 depart or 94 war, um, and trying to take full advantage of the Western peace dividend, uh, and allow Russia two or three years to build up that unrealistic, uh, economic resurgence. Uh, but, uh, anyway, so, so we're, we're not far off, uh, TK, uh, with a, with a 94 war, uh, but it was that August coup and I'll have to, uh, and Joel, the credit for the uh, the uh, the speech off the tank. Uh, that was uh, that was uh, his role. And with that, uh, over to you, Joel. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think we kind of have a hybrid. We we have our hard point of departure, which is the August coup. But really, the important thing that sets up that departure is our fictional character, you know, Pavel Med Medvedev, this, who becomes the Soviet president. And that there's things going on that, that we don't describe in the book, that he's this kind of hybrid hardliner slash uh, utilitarian who uh, is is sparring with Gorbachev through the 1980s um, and a little bit of the inspiration was actually from science fiction from the new uh, Battlestar Galactica okay. um, if you th there's in the the last season there's a great cup there's a great episode where there's there's a coup launched on the spaceships against um, the military and civ civilian leadership and, and there's just this great what I feel like really inspired by historical coups plot line where uh, the coup could go either way. It could go for the plotters if they're if they're willing to be ruthless enough. Right. Um, and if they're not, then it's going to fail. It's on a knife's edge. And uh, and so we we kind of put the August coup into that situation that if you have this guy who's willing to come in and be ruthless, um, it's going to succeed. Um, and with the groundwork kind of un unspoken already been laid in the years leading up to that, uh, I as a kid um moved to moscow just a few weeks after the august coup oh, and wow. lived lived there lived in moscow for two more through two more coup attempts uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh or insurrections whatever you want to call them but if you you know yeah. I, I remember going down to central moscow and taking pictures uh with the the white house that yeltsin had brought in tanks to to blast the uh, his opponents and right you know, got some pictures of me <laughs> yeah exactly uh so i've got some pictures of me as a kid you know uh and what a lot of people don't know is that that's right next to the u.s embassy too yeah. um where i would do boy scouts um uh, so uh so I, I had kind of some personal uh personally invested in kind of you know what it was like in moscow during that time and and right. some real affection actually for the city and and the people in the city so did you learn Russian while you were over there or uh, were you just in, in the American schools? I I did learn Russian. Don't ask me to speak it now. <laughs> I can still read it and understand it pretty well, but speaking is, uh, is a challenge. Yeah. That I always run into this problem is that uh, I was a, a, a Russian linguist in the Navy, but it's like, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time learning, you know, how to get to the Bolshoi theater. You know, we were like very <laughs> specific about, okay, did that guy fire a missile or what? <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, very specialized vocabulary. Yeah. You're going to say something, Colin? Well, my stepmother was is a native Chinese speaker, but you could not have her be a linguist, a military linguist without, even if it was in Mandarin or Cantonese, it's just that's it's different from what normal people do. So I can imagine that. So, yeah. And... <laughs> I mean, even looking at our own language, you know, and, and the stuff that we write, even there's so much jargon, there's so much, so many acronyms yeah. and, you know, yeah, English is, English is the beast of a language, especially when it, you add in some field manuals in there. So, yeah. And, true. and no matter how you write it, go ahead, Mike. Oh, no, I was just going to say true. I mean, once you get into the military ease, so to speak, <laughs> you know, we just, you know, acronyms are our fuel. So right. when we're putting that into into our writing, you know, a lot of people notice it, even if they're not, you know, from military backgrounds, they get that what we're saying is right. We're doing it right. And it's just a nice touch that adds some realism to it and, you know, kind of helps our product, you know, whether it's a blog or a novel or both in you know, some cases, you know, kind of reach out to an audience, a larger audience. Right. Yeah, you know, and sometimes you get a little bit of a backlash, you know, and you can't please everybody. Um, and, and we all have to figure out what's the, you know, what's the fine line of, of rivet counting, um, you know, that you want to, how much effort do you want to put into this? Yeah. Uh, and, sure. and then if you get it perfectly right, somebody comes in and blows away and goes, oh, my God, I can't believe how much I had to listen to all these, you know, <laughs> ANSR79, you know, get out of town, folks. But um and I think actually Colin brought something up uh, in, and I think it was in your review of um, Advanced to Contact, uh, but that, hey, you know, just give the give the the nomenclature 
when you're first describing it and then get the hell away from it then let yeah. it go yeah that's basically what i'm i mean there's that and there's the fact that you should basically the context is could someone not to completely familiar get the context of it so like if you have say a so like if you have something say a uh division artillery group or DAG or DAG, I don't know what the formal term for it is, but you can pretty much guess what that is, even if you don't really know that much. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know how big, but if you get what's called a front, you don't know right away how big a front is, but so therefore you need a bit of context to explain that a front is a really, really big army formation and probably the largest field formation there basically is right so that's and, how it's it's just a yeah. loose rule for me obviously you can't one size doesn't excuse me fit all yeah and, and as a navy guy that's been my biggest problem i'm just trying to keep track of all these army uh, formations and sizes <laughs> we uh we got around that a little bit by having my daughter proofread the book um if she could understand it anybody could there you go Okay. Well, editors. Yeah, oh. Mike, we were uh, speaking of you. Uh, what's oh. your what's your point of divergence on uh, World War Three, nineteen eighty seven? Point of divergence is pretty simple. Um, it's pretty much the August coup of ninety one. Starts off a little sooner. Starts off in March of eighty seven. Um, Grigory Romanov, who was a big time hardliner back then, um, he's the uh, ringleader of the coup. They depose Gorbachev, and Romanov comes in with his crew. And they have these big plans. They want to restore Russia's prominence in the world, build the economy back up, make the people happy. But then once he gets in, he realizes just how big the problems really are. Right. Kind of similar to Gorbachev. You know, Gorbachev got in and he saw for himself just how rough things were. You know, the country was on the decline. It was a you know, declining power, really. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of... I'm kind of vague with the background for that. I really haven't done much work on that, but you know, through the pre-war entries, you see that it leads to war eventually. Tensions rise, US and Soviet Union are on a collision course, and eventually that leads to Europe, fighting in Europe. So from that point on, it's pretty much the way the game board was back then, as far as units, right. dispositions, deployments, um, politicians, general officers, the ones who were in office and in command back then are the same ones who were in the book. So there really weren't many fictional characters who came into the blog. So it's pretty much a um, historical narrative, I guess, alternative historical narrative, so to speak. And yeah, the nice I, thing about that... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. No, you're good. No, all you. I, I was just going to say, um, you know, I kind of split the difference uh, in my series so I am telling a lot of the stories from the higher ups. So, you know, you did have your yeah. drop offs and your carters uh, and, and their cabinets are, are all, you know, real people. But as you, as you break down with a few exceptions, like I do follow uh, and uh, George, George W. Bush is, is in there and uh, <laughs> Oliver North shows up. Oliver North really got in there because he was a, uh, he was, you know, highly requested every time I asked anybody, all right, who do you want to hear from? My readers really wanted Ollie, so Ollie. <laughs> so he's in there. Um, um, but yeah, but then there's a ton of of you know uh, just completely fictional characters, um, you know that are that are just kind of thrown in there. Yeah, that, I'm yeah. very much for fictional characters. I generally tend not to like historical figures, but I did include a historical figure. Like one of the centerpieces of All Union's plot is a surviving Nikolay Ceausescu, right. I'm terrible with non-English names, who is basically the single most unrealistic part of the plot. Like <laughs> by the time I have the main war between the USSR and Romania in 1998, I can safely say reading every history of Romania that for Ceausescu to even be alive period, much less in power and able to mobilize a huge army is about as plausible as Operation Sea Lion working and the New York Jets <laughs> playing good football all in one timeline. 
<laughs> or, yes, I or, know Aaron Rodgers is going to burn out. It's going to be like Joe Namath with the Rams in reverse. Sorry, I had to throw that in. I'm a long-suffering Jets fan. Uh, or as implausible, like, as implausible as Eagle Claw working? Yeah, like Eagle Claw is <laughs> Sea Lion and Eagle Claw both working. Um, Eagle Claw was probably I've, everything I've heard about Eagle Claw was that it's was that it was a good thing that it failed as early as it did because if it actually gotten to Tehran, the city would be destroyed, the hostages would probably all be killed, and you would have like a giant war right there because it it was yeah. It, but yeah, so. I basically have pure fictional characters because I find it gives me a lot of flexibility because I don't need to worry about getting a historical figure really right if I can just have it. And I can sometimes do the different splitting of making a fictional character who's inspired by one or more, but you can still make them your own person, as I like to call it in a Simpsons reference. You don't need to worry about getting Mike Tyson right if you're writing about Dredrick Tatum, the right. parody of him. Yeah. So that's that's the sort of that's basically just my philosophy. And I was glad to write that, and I was also glad to write a smaller semi-war of between this changed Soviet Union, its Bulgarian client state. Bulgaria is basically the only Warsaw Pact country left in the timeline and this Romania, and I kind of likened it to a Soviet Gulf War, but it's not going to, obviously going to be pretty different, so that was also fun to write, and yeah, so it's, like I said, my my divergence follows the story rather than the other way around. This isn't, yeah, and that's, and I like basically lean far more on the spectrum of fictional characters over historical figures. And that's just how I tend to go. That makes yeah, sense. We're, uh, we're with uh, Colin on that. I think the closest thing we've got to a historical figure is the grandson of the most senior U.S. general killed in World War II. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but we use, we use historical figures as almost role models. I don't know hand over to Joel to talk about that since, since he's put time and effort into the characters here. I mean, definitely we've got um, Admiral Faulkner, who's kind of a little bit mo modeled after Admiral Spruance from um, from the Second World War. Uh, you don't want a carbon... I, I, I think Bart would agree. We don't want a carbon copy. We don't want to take Spruance and put him into World War III. Um, but, you know, we, we try to um kind of bring some some aspects of their their characters um that that we like and see how they play uh in the world we've created um we we kind of when we have historical we do have historical characters in the novel but we try to just not name them um you know we we talk about them more anonymously uh, so there's one or two surviving historical characters we have in the Soviet government. Actually, one of them is going to become relatively important. Um, who uh, we know who they are, but we're not going to tell the re the reader who they are. <laughs> yes. um, and uh, and then also we we try to to leave some things ambiguously. So like the U.S. presidential election in 1992, um, we don't want to say who won that election. You know, right. it could be Bill Clinton. <laughs> it 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 could be George Bush or it could be somebody else who came out of our timeline who um you know no nobody's heard of it was clearly um, Ross Perot <laughs> <laughs> yeah see I so, I've got to say I've absolutely loved writing the the presidential election of 1980 and uh and I, I had so much fun writing that it's also earned me the most one star reviews uh but um <laughs> I can't I just I it really affected people, man. It's like show me, show me where the book touched you. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> yep, yep. So, um, having written, you know, these alternative, you know, history, Cold War goes hot books. Have any of you guys thought of another point of departure that you that you're thinking about exploring, or is there something that you think is just absolutely? No way, just just not a good idea. And and I, the one thing I want to say before I unleash that on the crowd is, I noticed that we all wrote our books within like a twelve year timeline. Um, you know, mine is the earliest, starting in seventy nine, 
and 80, you know, going up into 94. Um, mm -hmm. Why didn't any of us like find something in the 60s? Um, I, I find that interesting. Okay, I'm going to probably, uh, this actually leads me to my point of divergence that I was considering um, and that I have wanted to write, which is kind of buried down underneath the 10 other writing ideas and a hundred AI picture generations that I'm too busy with That's or right. video games or everything else. But anyway, the divergence I was considering was that exact period and that was a European conflict, um, a sort of Cold War gone hot, conventionally at least at first, um, conflict arising from the Vietnam War. And the divergence I have is the US goes ahead with Operation El Paso, which was a planned ground invasion of Laos with American and Southern troops. Southerners later tried to do that themselves in Lamson 719, but it's kind of thing like that. And that sort of leaves things spiraling out of control. And then you get a fold apocalypse in about 1970 or so. And okay. the, anyway, so, but I think the theories I've had for the reason why people put their divergences in the 80s and beyond, I have, I have three main theories for that. The first and most rivet counting of them is the belief that the military balance is too stacked in the Soviets' favor. The that like are going to they're going to win too easily. Their conventional forces are too strong, and that's the first. And that's what. And that, from a pure rivet counting standpoint, is the issue with that. That's the first one. I think uh, one of our characters says something about probably why why um, none of us chose an earlier point of departure, which is that anything earlier would have gone probably nuclear. Yeah, um, too fast and, to tell the story. Yeah, yep. and, yeah and 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 the, the the game stops being fun when the explosions get too big. But I'd let Bart talk about why uh, you know why 1994 is fun um let me just so but yeah the actually the late 60s early 70s were when you really started to see the first like detailed conventional only plans being made it was like a step away from the pentomic division everything's going nuclear when i've read field manuals from both sides the american translated soviet ones and if, if it's like 100 pages, if, if you're around 1960, it's about 100 pages, and non-nuclear operations are either this one page, one two-page afterthought or just not brought up at all. But then 10 years later, and it's and it gets more and more so. And I mean, I'd like to talk about nuclear weapons in that, but this isn't really the focus of it. Anyway, can I go on to my second and third points for why I think the divergence isn't that... Um, so the second one, and this is also kind of like related, but kind of, it has to do with military hardware, but not in that strict force balance way, is that I think we already saw what stuff from the 60s and 70s was doing. So there was Vietnam, even though that wasn't much of an armor war, but you have the Arab-Israeli wars, 67, 73, the war of attrition between that, you have India and Pakistan, you have these, so you, we've seen what high intensity war with 60s, 70s tech, like patents, T-55, 62s, that sort of thing looked like for the most part. And so it's, it's less novel to me than seeing a, say, 80s, 90s stuff in something that isn't a squash like the real Gulf War was, that's more novel, and that's one reason why I think people do have gone with that divergence instead. So that was number two? That's the second one, yes. So what do you got for number three? <laughs> the third one, I think, is simply because of the time when the first contemporary, then contemporary World War Threes appeared. So like Hackett was in 79, 80, 
chieftains, Red Storm Rising, Red Army, that kind of thing's all in that 80s time period. And then you basically get, and since because of that left the impression, many people will get that, will just go for that because it's the impression that they've got. So that's the third one, basically. Gotcha. I think those are all, those are all uh, compelling. Yeah, those, sure. are, those are good. I think though, um, as far as, you know, the uh, timelines and starting up in the eighties where you have the, um, the change, well, not the change, but you know, the, in the eighties, that's when really a lot of the readers for a lot of our books, our blogs, whatever, they lived through it. Right. right? Just like us, we grew up in the eighties. Um, I spent a couple summers over in uh, West Germany at Bitburg when my dad was over there. Sorry about that. And, <laughs> <laughs> and those were the best summers of my life. <laughs> well, yeah. Sorry for blowing it up twice in my book. I know. <laughs> I, I forgive you. I understand. <laughs> but for a lot of these people, you know, that's when that was a big part of our lives. And, right. um, you know, I think also another another aspect that really works in our favor is that that's when a lot of war gaming started coming out. Right. Right. Of, um, that's true. Big interest. In, yeah. Big interest in war gaming. And you had games like um, golf strike, uh, the GM strike. <laughs> yeah. There were a lot of red storm rising. Um, NATO, the next war in Europe, you know, people played those games and that got people thinking about beyond the game, you know, what war in Europe might look like. Yeah. So, you know, Bart mentioned uh, Harpoon earlier. Um, yeah. And and I, were you referring to the to the computer version or the butcher paper? Uh, both actually uh, playing around with the butcher paper one in the in the mid '80s, and then uh, Harpoon, the computer game, was uh, the first game I got for my computer. It was absolutely fantastic. Crashed about one every ten minutes, once every ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Do a total system restart, but that yeah. didn't matter. Uh, went online long distance on my phone modem to the bulletin board in New York City to, to get scenarios. Uh, wow. Started uploading scenarios to that, and I was I was fixated. I'm an army guy, uh, and uh, this stuff fixated me. And then uh, managed to get myself on the Naval Gunfire Support Course, which was the hardest four hours of work I ever did in a week. Uh, <laughs> and that, 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 that tipped me into uh, Navy stuff. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and, and, uh, so I'm a forward air controller. I've done naval stuff. Uh, when I did the nuclear fire planning course in the mid eighties, that scared the hell out of me. And I wanted to stay away from that as much as we can. That's why we slid into the nineties a little bit. Um, and, uh, and I think that, uh, the later eighties and early nineties, had we followed the technical, um, sort of streams that were running, um, then then that's what we're trying to show in uh, in Northern Fury '94 uh, that that the Russians actually had some pretty decent stuff in the pipeline right. if they were able to um, manufacture it, which itself is a bit of a pipe dream, but but it's a it's a nice white f or what if. Uh, so I, I wanted to to play around with that. A bit. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. In fact, you know, I actually got my uh, one of the reasons why I thought I might be able to pull off a novel was writing after action reports for Harpoon games for my friends. You know, I had friends that didn't even play the game. We, we actually were all flight sim dorks. And uh, and I would just write I'd, I'd play Harpoon on my lunch break and then write it up and, and send it out to them. And they're like, oh, this is great, man. I'm like, all I did was play a video game and told you what happened. What are you talking about? <laughs> Which is actually scary. Harpoon once. Now, What's that? I've played tons and tons and tons of Command, but I have never played Harpoon once. Wow. But I did play Jane's Fleet Command, and that was sort of like the stepping stone that got me into Command Modern Operations. Because when I saw the interface of like, it's just like a chip logos and things, it's like, I, I knew, I have, at least I knew what the basics were. And that was sort of like an invaluable get me into that. And it's, was basically amazing from there. So yeah, I have not played a single um, a single second of Harpoon. And to be honest, because Command has sort of superannuated it, I'm not oh, really yeah. sure I want to. Big time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's because you're so young, Colin. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I was born in 91, so I did not live in the 80s. I lived go. in the 90s and 2000s, and it actually re- kind of reflects in my books, because in my non-alternate history books and in All Union, I have a lot of seeds in the 90s and 2000s, so it's kind of that callback to my childhood there, but so that's not a full apocalypse, but yeah, it's it's something, and... So that's, TK is yeah, uh, that's about the same age. Isn't yeah, eighty nine, late eighty nine. So okay. yeah, same right. thing. Yeah, Just but to, uh, to piggyback on what what Mike said though about about games, um, I mean, in Northern Fury, the story we're telling is is Bart's story. I like Bart's been been telling the story through scenarios, you know, uh, and 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 I, you know, he invited me along along to to tell it, but. The thing was, is like I experienced his story through the command scenarios, and just like you, I wrote, you know, wrote up uh, AARs of it because to me, the Bart has an ability to tell stories through scenarios that is really, really fun for me. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I guess I don't know if I'm. I think a lot of people are like this that that we make up the stories of what we're experiencing in the games that we're playing. Like mm-hmm. um, the game mm-hmm. we're playing is kind of a story, uh, and so. It, I think it's kind of a natural, uh, you know, a, a natural inspiration. Yeah. It's, when I started reading Joel's AARs, I, I said, I better get this young fellow on board or he's going to give up me and write this book first. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. Alex. Uh, yeah, Mike. Uh, just out of curiosity, what flight sims were you into when you were uh, younger? Uh, World War II, mostly. I was all, right. uh, okay. all over Air Warrior back in the in the early '90s, back when that was really the only oh, yeah. massively multiplayer game. Uh, but yeah. at the time, it was uh, Aces High when Air Warrior went tits up. Uh, I remember Warrior. that one. Yeah, and oh. uh, I was just a terror in a Yak Nine U. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of Yak men in the game, but it was faster than a pony at uh, sea level. So, gotcha. <laughs> but that was actually, you know, because I'm I'm such an analyst. Um, I really, I really fell into this, this, this fascinating idea that, okay, uh, uh, if you look at American aircraft, especially just take fighters, um, they're optimized for as high of an altitude as you can get because right. they are escorting bombers. They want to be able to outperform fighters at the altitude the bombers are operating at. Um, Russia, no, they were like, oh, if we're above 10,000, 15,000 feet, we're doing it wrong because they're <laughs> all concentrated on the ground support and yeah. protecting those aircraft. So if you didn't want to spend 20 minutes climbing to 30,000 feet, you know, you're better off in a Soviet airplane. <laughs> and then the and then the and then the Cold War runs around and the things get reversed because you get the MiG-15 which is a bomber interceptor first right. and a fighter jet second and then yep. the Sabre is kind of the opposite. So yeah. Yep. <laughs> kind of ironic in that sense, but that's what requ- changing requirements mean. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and it's just the, you know, it's the evolution, you know, you, you, they, they needed airplanes that could get higher and faster, um, you know, because we had B-29s, you know, <laughs> you know, that now they didn't have to worry about B-17s or B-29s when they were fighting the Germans. They didn't have, you know, massive heavy bombers. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, that's my, I think another technical Easter egg I did and for all unions since we're on military rivet counting is, I made the Object 640 Black Eagle semi-mythical tank, the main tank in the 90s, and I just called it the T-94 because the T-95 is a real, it was a real, another real never war pro- prototype, and the T-93, 1993 seemed like too soon to get it into service, so I kind of split the difference, 94. It's, it's kind of fun to do it. I like, one of the guilty pleasures of mine is looking up strange things that were like mostly only existed on blueprints and then finding a way if I can sort of sneak them in somehow. And yeah. That's cool. That's, yeah. That's I wish cool. I had the courage to do that. I, I really wanted to include like the Black Eagle, but I, I, I couldn't make it work. I, I, I shied away from that. I mean, it's basically <laughs> just a T-80 upgrade with with a turret, with a bustle auto loader turret, other things. It's not that hard, but you get some pretty crazy stuff like the MX hovercraft, which are like a giant hovercraft that would fly across the Great Plains and then shoot MX missiles. 
to back at Russia after they launched. And then you have a fighter plane that was actually intended to use its own sonic boom as a weapon. Like it would just fly over the enemy, hit the gas and then boom. <laughs> These are real proposals. And it's, it's, it's kind of, you could do an entire book on just those. It would be amazing and silly, but also amazing. Well, I got, I got a chronoplons to work in, uh, in uh, advanced contact. So that was something. There was actually got them in uh, Baltic. Yeah, there was a whole in the subplot. <laughs> there, was, there was a whole subplot in the book that was all about the naval security group uh, tracking radio transmissions and CIA tracking fuel, you know, dispersion, and 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 yeah. they were all trying to figure out what it was all about. And it turned out it was the Acronoplons, and and yeah, the editor ripped the whole thing right out. <laughs> <out. So> <laughs> this is and this is why I like about about Colin's book is that Colin's book it it it's it's everything you know like they told me the the editor was like dude this is a this is a war book you know it's not a uh treatise on international relations so yoink there went a half of my dialogue between <laughs> Major Brzezinski and uh and Harold Brown and you know it's it's not a murder or it's not a, it's not a mystery book so yank there went the uh the NSGA story about the chronoplons and uh and it's not a yeah, and 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 you know, for crying out loud, you know, just cut out a few more of these uh, you know characters. So there was a, a Iranian uh, colonel that, uh, that I loved him. He was he was a great character, great storyline. He was uh, you know trained in um, so psychology. So it was it was a neat story, but yeah, it was on on the cutting room floor. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's honestly one of the reasons why I've never seriously considered a like a big name or what I call traditional publishing is because I like having total control over my own setting too much. So it's like, yeah, I can write a combination romance, mystery, Red Storm Rising knockoff. It's, it's, it's fun. I mean, I like writing it. And my biggest writing inspiration is actually not any of the techno thriller writers at all. And that's another thing that I like because I'm, actually wanting to, assuming I ever get around to making them, moving the next All Unions more in his direction, and that's the Sidney Sheldon, if you know that name, kind sure. of like a low-octane thriller writer, and I mean that in the best possible way. It's, or what I call the pop epic. Like, he's one of the more popish ones, and other guys like James Michener are more on the epic end, but basically a big, long tale that's both big and accessible and that's the kind of thing i found i like reading yeah like long period of time but able you're able to get into it and that's yeah. what i like so yeah yeah i see that well you, you know editors oh go ahead. go ahead mike no no tell us about it oh, i was just gonna say editors can be good they can be your friends and they can be your enemy yeah, actually, you know, and on that, you know, I, I while I do bitch about it, I think that uh, that she was absolutely right. I mean, you know, those are great stories. They're fun, yeah. but they they bulked up the book so much that I don't think it would have gone anywhere. Um, Let me ask you this. Your editor, did she have experience with uh, techno thrillers, war books, things yeah, like that? Yeah, well, she does. She does. She does a lot of war porn. Yeah. So. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. My yeah. editor, my editor, this was his first. Oh, good. And um, yeah, so it's been a it's been quite a learning experience for him. And for yeah, me. actually, <laughs> when I got my first uh, when I got my first edits back, um, it occurred to me that what happened was I spent the first third of the book just trying to make sure everybody understands how goddamn smart I am. And uh, <laughs> so it was where all that political you know, theory comes in. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. Me and uh, and a half a dozen people in the world care about this. So <laughs> oh yeah, I it's like I felt the need in some cases to just put all the research I learned into nuclear fuel cycles and prospective nuclear weapons infrastructure. And yeah, it's, it's the sort of thing you like, but you can clearly know that most people don't. And right. yeah, but it's always that temptation is there because, you know, and yeah. this is where I honestly think, and this is what Bart and Joel have been doing is that the, having a sort of appendix, whether it's in this book itself or online yes. or whatever, to just get all the info dumps out of it is just um, something that you can do just as that release valve. You can put all that stuff you thought, it's still there, but the reader doesn't necessarily have to go to it. And if I have, if I have something I want to 
release that's not in it, I can just drop it on Fold Apocalypse. Like, in Fold <laughs> yeah. Apocalypse, I have a description of how many aircraft were lost in the soviet Romanian War, even though that's not relevant at all to the actual book. But I, right. still, it and I still had fun writing it. So, yeah. That's I will say... Point. I will say that, that that the Northern Fury website is bananas. I mean, there's so much detail in there. It makes me want to just just throw my website away and, and, and call it a day. Yeah, well, that, that's uh, that's evidence that I've got uh, very bad OCD. Um, and uh, and I don't know when to stop. Um, I get digging into a rabbit hole and uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so. We, uh, but uh, getting back to the editor or the, uh, the the publisher thing, we uh, we looked around for I think it was about a year or so. Uh, mm-hmm. We couldn't get any bites, um, so we said the heck with it, and we just did it ourselves. Right. Um, yeah. The downside of that is that our book probably has too many characters and probably a hundred too many pages, or maybe more. Um, and uh, and but people seem to be okay with that, I guess. Um, uh, but yeah, a, that's that's most of the comment I think. That's a good product. I mean, you, you guys wrote a great book. Thank you. So, Thank you. I mean, yeah, we, we think, did. We. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say I think both Mike and Colin have have pointed this out, which is the genre is much smaller than we kind of expected mm-hmm. that it would be, um, and so you know our our core audience, um, you know, <laughs> I'm just trying not to say mean things, but they would accept a uh, a much worse product. Um, <laughs> And uh, and so it's good. They, I, I think that everybody here at, you know, on this on this, you know, meeting has written a really, you know, a quality book that, that serves the purpose of, of filling that uh, that need. So, yeah. yeah, I'll tell you what, though, um, you know, bringing that up, that brings up a good thought for me. And in the fact that the audience matters so much. So when we're writing these kind of books in the genre, books or blogs, you know, we're catering to a specific kind of audience. Now, what I'm dealing with with my publisher is a larger audience, a mass audience. Mm-hmm. So I can't, I wasn't able to write Dawn of the Dragon the same way I really wanted to. Um, and it makes a lot of changes, you know, the type of audience that you're catering to. Who's going to read this book? Who do they want to read this book? As opposed to just kind of getting a whole audience of our kind of people right. together to read it. So mm-hmm. it really it has a big impact on how you write that book. You know, how you lay it out, what you include, what you don't include, and all of that. So, yeah, know. I think Alex, that's absolutely true. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, you've probably seen that in some of your reviews from people and some of your feedback. All of you guys have probably. I know I have. You know, I mean, the the folks who read this genre, they want accuracy. They, they want everything <laughs> to be totally on target, on point. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. they get it right, and sometimes they get it wrong. I had one guy... He spent about four or five different emails just right in a row telling me why the F-15 um, performed worse with uh, conformal fuel tanks as opposed to without them. And I couldn't just turn around and say, you're really talking to the wrong person about this. I, just, I was like, wow, that's interesting. That's good. You know, but, you know, the people, the readers in this genre know their stuff. And yeah. They want that to be known when you, if you, they think you screwed up. They're going to let you know. They're going to let you have it. It's so. it's funny because, uh, and, and Colin saw this, but in the uh, Sea Lion Press uh, bulletin board, there was a discussion about uh, about AI and using AI in, uh, in writing. And I was just like, well, I use it for research. I ask the AI questions. And if it gives me an answer that at least sounds plausible, uh, okay, I'll take that. You know, if I have to do a little more digging, I'll do a little more digging. But ultimately, I'm going to leave it to my beta readers to tell me if I've really got something horribly wrong. And uh, and there was just some some weirdos on that forum that didn't that just didn't take to the idea that you would that you should try to be as accurate as possible, you know, in this particular genre. So I, I, yeah, I don't know. It, it's a long story in its own right. But uh, the important thing you have to realize, besides obviously who you're writing for, what pressures you're at, is that. You simply cannot please everyone and you shouldn't try to. So that's right. Sure. That's right. Yeah. Okay, well, we're mentioned... coming up. Oh, go oh, ahead, sorry. go ahead, Joel. I, oh, was I just mean Bart's say mentioned we're up... <laughs> Bart's mentioned before that uh I mean he's an army guy, I'm an army guy too, and we're writing about mostly naval and air stuff. And uh yep. I mean I mean Mike and Alex, you guys are 
naval and air guys and i think you write a lot a lot about ground stuff sure. uh, i think the That's way right. we the way mark and i describe it is it's just different enough from our day jobs that that it doesn't feel like work um so you know and, and then it maybe keeps us sharp to make sure that we are being accurate or trying to be accurate at least yeah and i'm the armchair guy who could not do who has not had and been anywhere close to the military in real life and could not do anything in an actual war except get killed. So I'm so that's what I do, and I'm very honest about that, but I still try to do my best. Oh, we can find it. We can find a place for you in intelligence, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Intelligence or being the first wave to march into Bakhmut, that kind of suicidal drone. Oh, bullet that's, sponge, yeah. Yeah, bullet sponge or intelligence. That's basically what I could only what I could be useful for. But yeah, it's yeah, that's yeah, I mean, I've yeah, I found that it's it's yeah, it's you when you have these niches and things, it gets kind of it can be kind of different in how people look at it and not just how compared to how like broader normal fans of right fiction, even that kind of fiction look at it. And it's kind of honestly a little fascinating, but yeah. And I think yeah. you know, we've heard a couple of people on the call, you know, mention, I think I know uh, Colin has, uh, and I know I certainly am looking, you know, forward to stretching my my wings a little bit and and trying to get out of the the war porn, you know, specific genre. I would like to do a little historical fiction, but I have to admit I'm terrified uh, because in in a current in my current book, you know, I've got anywhere between what thirty and fifty thousand words that are all just pew 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 pew, and you know, if I rip that out, what do I got left? You know, oh my god, I may have to develop my characters. What's this all about? <laughs> well guys we're, we're coming up on an hour um and and i do have uh i do have some place to get to uh but i wanted to say thank you guys very much um this has been thank a you. lot of fun for me same here yeah, yeah thanks alex thanks for putting it together and thank and you, you know for all the for the viewers anybody that actually made it this far hit like and subscribe to my channel um <laughs> But no, come join us on Twitter. We're at Warporn. I'll put a link to the community in the uh, in the description. And again, it's all war, no porn. So, all right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. We are going to do this again. I'm sure of it. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds Thank good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Right. Take care, guys. Nice seeing you guys. Bye.